Good morning and thank you very much for joining me on our farm walk. Uh, the weather this morning is a little bit overcast. There's a little bit of wind about as well, but hopefully you'll be able to hear me. Um, but this is my walk to work to Shimpling Park Farm and I'm really glad that you can join me. Our own farm is about 650 hectares. We farm a further 980 hectares for other local farmers. And it's all done organically. Uh, we're a family farm. Uh, we employ three people on the arable side. That's Andrew, Greg and Sam. Robert looks after all our sheep. Alan and Peter do all the estate work on the farm and Wendy comes in on a part-time basis to help us with our books. Alice, my wife, does all the rental properties and we're about eight miles south of Bury St Edmunds in Suffolk. So we started converting the farm to organic production in 1999, uh, primarily as a diversification exercise, but I was also getting increasingly worried about the amount of pesticides that we were using on the farm, and I just wanted to find a more nature-friendly way of farming. So we manage our farm as a whole farm system under a government-approved body, Organic Farmers and Growers, under DEFRA's UK Organic Regulation. Here we are arriving at Shimpling Park Farm. Just got to nip in and see our arable team, but I'll be out in a couple of minutes and we can continue our farm walk. What I thought would be interesting is we actually walk the rotation so you can see the range of crops that we grow. It has been a very difficult year, so we're slightly limited in what we've got on the ground, uh, but hopefully I'll show you something of interest and help you get an idea of what an organic rotation looks like. I see the start of our rotation as the fertility building part and this is generally in the ground for two years or possibly three in some cases. Uh, we have two types here. The first type is grass and clover lays, predominantly for feeding the sheep and making haylage for our own flock. The second is a straight fertility builder including red clover, crimson clover, Persian clover, burstfoot trefoil, a little bit of sandfoin and some rib grass and chicory for the soil. It's also a great source of food for pollinators. This is usually cut and mulched to build soil organic matter, but it can be also used for feeding lambs. After our fertility building phase, we generally put in a winter cereal and behind me you can see a crop of winter wheat. This crop was established last October, having broken the lay with minimum tillage. But as you can see, modern wheat varieties are very short and they are very uncompetitive with weeds. And so we do also grow a heritage wheat blend, which is much taller and smothers weeds well. But this could also be spelt or even winter oats, depending on what the market wants. Both spelt and oats are also great for competing with weeds. Our second cash crop in the rotation is normally always a spring cereal. That's partially due to the fact that with two autumn crops in a row, we start selecting too many autumn weeds. And secondly, because at this point in the rotation, there's less fertility in the soil and uh, a spring crop suits that situation better. Here we've got some min-till spring oats, which we really like for their allelopathic effect on weeds but also their architecture. They've got a nice big long flag leaf, which is good for smothering weeds as well. Or it can be spring triticale, which is a cross between wheat and rye and used for feeding organic animals. Or it could be spring barley, as it grows shorter than the oats or triticale, meaning that we can weed surf it if we have fields with a problem like charlock or wild oats. But I'll show you the weed surfer later on when we have a chat about mechanical weeding. Out of interest, this uh, field of spring barley was the first field that we converted in 1999 and hasn't had a herbicide on it for 20 years. I have a love-hate relationship with the next crop in our rotation and they are winter beans. Uh, farmers call them a sorry crop. You're either sorry you grew them or sorry you didn't grow more. But at this point in the rotation, we like a legume because it fixes a little bit of nitrogen, enabling us to grow another spring crop. I have tried growing spring beans on the farm, but they don't compete particularly well with weeds and neither do peas. I have to say that when they're on flower, they do smell absolutely fantastic. And uh, they're a great source of food for pollinators as well. And we have a number of beehives on the farm and I have to say that the honey from bean flowers is absolutely delicious. And finally, the last crop in our rotation is spring barley. It's usually the dirtiest cereal uh, we have because it comes after the beans and it's the end of the rotation. But we are under sowing this with our fertility building lays, which are in the ground for two years. And during those two years, it give, gives us a chance to clean the fields up again. 
I would actually prefer to grow spring wheat at this point in the rotation instead of the barley because it's where we're most likely to get an organic milling premium. The wheat also lets more light into the crop, which is much better for the undersown lays. But the difficulty we have is we seem to suffer with gout fly here, which tends to decimate the yield. So that's a run through the rotation. Uh, on our own farm, as I showed you, we do have two year lays, uh, but on our contract farms, we just have a single year lay, uh, which is mainly dominated by red clover. Our, on our own farm, as I said, uh, we have uh, some grazing lays, but also a pure fertility building lay as well, uh, depending on what the needs of the fields are. But anyway, uh, I thought I might just do a little section now on mechanical weeding. So I'm just going to run through uh, the different bits and pieces we use for mechanical weeding. We use three types of weeders at Chimping Park Farm. We have an intero hoe, a weed surfer, and this is our harrow comb. The harrow comb uses a series of vibrating tines, which are generally very good at taking out broadleaf weeds, but not so good at taking out grass weeds, otherwise it would take out the crop itself. It's also important to go when the crop is at an early stage of development and the weeds are small, otherwise once the weeds develop a large root, they're much more difficult to remove. The next mechanical weeder is our CTM Weed Surfer. These are particularly good for cutting weeds that stand proud from the crop. Underneath the hood of the weed surfer, there's a series of rotating blades which cut the weeds off over the top of the crop. In my experience, it's particularly good for cutting things like wild oats and charlock. And lastly, we have our system chameleon. It's called a system because it's able to sow crops as well as interrow hoe in between the crops that it has sown meaning that the establishment of lays with the system has been incredibly successful. And those lays are the backbone to building fertility on the farm. Equally, having the same machine intero hoe the crops that it has sown makes it incredibly accurate. Each hoe is mounted on a parallelogram design with a wheel at the back, making depth control really, really accurate. Being able to sculpt the weed from its roots is incredibly important and this is where the chameleon works so precisely. It's also very important to keep our lays clean and where the sheep can't do that for us, we do also have a mower uh, to mow the weeds when they do become a problem. So as you can see, uh, you know, there's various tools that we can use uh, to mechanically weed our fields. But I really see mechanical weeding as a sort of fire engine approach. Uh, to be absolutely honest, if you've got everything else right uh, in your husbandry, in your agronomics, uh, there should be no need for mechanical weeding. Um, but we have it because, you know, I just want to have a sort of a backstop just in case anything goes wrong. But if you've got a diverse system, you've got a good mixture of drilling dates, a good mixture of winter and spring cropping, also a good mixture of plants with uh, different architectural attributes, uh, then you should be able to uh, farm organically without any mechanical weeding at all. Um, I probably overthink these things, um, but uh, I like my farm to still look as though we are on top of some of the issues that uh, other farm organic farmers might not worry about. So the wind's uh, getting up a little bit, so I've just come behind this hedge. But what I really wanted to do was to uh, take you around the, the sheep and tell you a little bit about why uh, we brought them back into the farm in 2014 and why we chose the breed we have. So thinking back to harvest 2012, it was a pretty awful harvest for us. Um, uh, we had a lot of winter crops in the ground and uh, we suffered from chocolate spot on our beans, we suffered from yellow rust in our wheat and I can't remember what the barley got but it didn't do very well either. And I was just thinking about uh, bringing more resilience into my business and building some more fertility to grow healthier crops, um, but also a bit more diversity as far as um, uh, what we were, the enterprise we have on the farm. And so that's why uh, we thought about uh, bringing some livestock back. One of the decisions we came to was that we were going to extend our rotation uh, by having uh, two year lays instead of a single year lay and uh, to you know not have any income out of both those um, years uh, we decided that looking at livestock would be a sensible option. 
So initially, I really thought about cattle. I just sort of fancied having cattle on the farm. But when I looked into the capital costs of uh, introducing cattle, of course, you've got to put up a shed, you've got to house them over the winter, certainly on our soils, which are about 35% clay. Uh, you've got to have permanent fencing, uh, pretty much, or you know some pretty uh, good stakes and high tensile wire. Uh, and also, you've got to take uh, water troughs around the farm as well. But when you start uh, considering sheep, I mean, basically that's all on, you know, pretty low cost electric fencing. Uh, we could move uh, water bowsers around the farm. Uh, and the idea was to have them living outside all year round, uh, just grazing our lays and also lambing outside as well. So I started looking into what breed that we might uh, choose. And uh, first of all, we, we looked at Clins. Uh, and also then we looked at uh, the Easy Care uh, breed, the one that sheds its wool, uh, the one that's crossed with, the, with a, um, a Wiltshire horn. Uh, and then our shepherd at the time, or our prospective shepherd at the time, uh, Will, uh, said, look, why don't you think about New Zealand Romneys? So um, I went to the National Sheep Association's um, uh, National Day, um, it must have been, yes, in sort of 2013 to look at all the, the breeds that were there and uh, also to get a good look at some, some Romneys and some Clins and um, got talking to a chap called Chris Hodgkins from Wairiri, UK and um, started thinking about, you know, how we could fit the New Zealand Romney into our system. So again, the idea was that they were to lamb outside. Uh, they're a breed uh, that have good feet. Uh, we, we never spend any time looking at their feet. They've got extremely good feet, a good resistance to worms and uh, good mothers. And um, I have to say, um, our experience with them has been absolutely fantastic. Um, one of the things I think that they are particularly good at, and you're looking at a, a pretty sort of rich uh, red clover and sort of grass lay behind me where we are fattening our lambs with their mothers at the moment. Uh, but the one thing they have been very good at, uh, especially over the last two very dry springs we've had, we haven't actually given them very good forage, but they have been absolutely amazing in the way that they've dealt with that and um, have uh, th thrived incredibly well on relatively poor pasture. Because we've only reintroduced them over a relatively short period of time, it's quite difficult to put, uh, you know, a financial uh, aspect onto how the lambing uh, enterprise is done. Because, of course, there's lots of other things that come into it. Um, first of all, there's the sale of lambs, but also that there's the increased yield in the crops that we've seen uh, um, after those two-year lays and having a grazing animal back into the system. Uh, but also, you've got to sort of consider, you know, the increase in soil organic matter as well that we're experiencing because of these lays and so over the next few years we'll be putting um, those things all together and just trying to work out exactly uh, what the reintroduction of livestock has meant to this farm in financial terms but also in all the other aspects that grazing animals bring into my system. So if you're looking to bring livestock back onto your farm I would suggest that uh, sheep are a cheap and easy way of doing it very low capital cost and um, you know I think sort of looking at all the benefits that a grazing animal brings onto the farm uh, is a as I've said before is a complex thing uh, but I really think that they're adding something very special here at Shimting Park Farm uh, I still do have a hankering to get some cattle and who knows um, come back in five years time just before we go on to talk about net zero I just wanted to mention a couple of trials that we're doing here at the moment the first is our living mulch trial. Uh, this is essentially under sowing a low growing white clover mix uh, within a standing crop. And then after harvest, just cultivating the rows where the crop was and then replanting a crop in that um, section, uh, but still leaving the living mulch in the soil and trying to build a relationship between that living mulch and the uh, preceding cash crops. I've mentioned uh, the importance of beans in our rotation, but also the problems we have with growing them organically. And one of those is chocolate spot. Um, so we are working with PGRO on a variety trial to see the major differences between the, uh, the various varieties we can grow in this country. The uh, trials are laid out in variety rows, but in between the rows, we've got some triticale to try and separate uh, the different varieties to stop disease spreading across each one if one gets a chocolate spot worse than the other. I'd now like to talk about our net zero ambitions here at Shimping Park Farm and there's probably no better place to stand 
and next to our farm diesel tank with a fresh delivery just being made this morning. In 2015 we worked with the farm carbon cutting toolkit to try and draw up a report to see where we were with carbon emissions here at Shimpling Park Farm. Looking at emission sources, our annual total carbon equivalent emissions amounted to 1,150 tonnes. And unsurprisingly, this mostly came from diesel use in tractors and combines and made up 29% of our emissions. Electricity usage amounted to 4% of emissions, which was mainly used for our grain drive, while our 50 kilowatt PV array offset 16 tonnes of CO2 and also gave some free electricity to the farm. Interestingly, wood, paper, wearing metal and tyres only made up 0.1% of our emissions. The manufacture of our tractors and telehandler amounted to 3% of emissions, depreciated over 10 years. But if the total amount was accounted for in a single year, it would equate to a hefty 37%. Nitrous oxide from crop residues oxidising in our soils contributed to 29%, while our fertility building lays contributed a further 17%. Having said that, the lays can also contribute a substantial increase in soil organic matter, which sequesters atmospheric carbon, but more of that later. In 2015, we had 250 breeding ewes who contributed 6.6% of emissions. We now have 1,000, and so that figure will be different today. 1.3% of our emissions in 2015 came from transporting our organic crops to a local feed mill. Again, this needs some scrutiny today with our spelt going to Wiltshire to be dehulled and our oats going to Northern Ireland. So that's the cost of what we do at Shimpling Park Farm in terms of emissions. But how are we sequestering carbon? Well, the 2015 report calculated that we are sequestering 454 tonnes of carbon per year. So how are we doing that? Well, 60% is sequestered in our woodlands. 21% is from permanent field margins, either in our environmental scheme or areas we have taken out of production to increase wildlife on the farm. And 18% is from the 17 miles of hedgerows we have in this ancient countryside. So, total annual carbon emissions less total annual carbon sequestration leaves us with a balance of carbon equivalent emissions of 696 tonnes. Taking into account our farm area and crop yields, that gives us a figure of 1.08 tonnes per hectare and 0.45 tonnes per tonne of product. But there's a glaring omission from that 2015 report. We didn't have the data on how much organic matter we have built over the last 20 years of organic farming, but we have that data now. I converted the farm to organic production in 1999 and through the reintroduction of lays and green manures into our system, our soil organic matter has risen from 2.9% to 5.5%, an increase of 2.6% or an annual increase of 0.13% per year. A 0.1% increase in soil organic matter on our hand slope series clay soils per hectare per year can sequester nearly seven tonnes of CO2 but we have sequestered just over nine tonnes of CO2. That's 5,870 tonnes of sequestered carbon across the whole farm annually. So our carbon balance in emissions of 696 tonnes has just been turned into a net sequestration of 5,174 tonnes per year. That makes us carbon negative. We are removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere while producing food as well as providing all the ecosystem services that organic farming does. So that all sounds great, doesn't it? And why can't we all do that? Well, I think, you know, we've had some pretty impressive short-term gains uh, through building soil organic matter on this farm. And that's really from the reintroduction of lays back into the system and also, uh, you know, having more green manures. But we can't keep on building carbon in the way that we have done over the last 20 years. So uh, what can we do in our farming business to make sure that we do remain at the very least um, carbon neutral. 
Well, the great thing about doing the kind of test that we've done with the uh, Carbon Farm Cutting Toolkit is that it gives you a really clear understanding of where your emissions are. And, you know, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind one of the key areas is diesel use on the farm. And so that's something we will be tackling to make sure that we do sit the right side of that carbon balance. So listen, that's quite enough for me. Um, I've really enjoyed uh, taking you around the farm. Uh, would love you to come here in person. Uh, so let's do that another year. Um, I very, very much come from the camp uh, that no one farming system is perfect. We're all doing different things and that's the wonderful thing about our industry. Uh, it's incredibly diverse and we've got so much to learn uh, from each other. I mean, I've just shown you what we do. Um, I think that we are beginning to get things right, um, but there's always room for improvement. But anyway, thank you so much again, and I look forward to seeing you all in person at some time after we get through this uh, very strange time. Thank you.